All right. Uh, thank you for joining me and Kosuke for uh, talk for continuous delivery at cloud scale. Uh, the agenda for the talk today is we talk about continuous delivery. We talk about uh, Docker. Um, Kosuke has, uh, you know, I hope made an effective case of uh, why Docker and um, laid out what we've done in open source with that. Uh, he's going to drill down and do a demo around it. Uh, and uh, uh, then, uh, sorry, bro. And then we talk about CV with Jenkins and Docker. That's where he's he's going to do a demo. I'll, I'll spend some time around the Cloud Bees Jenkins platform and uh, laying out uh, uh, some of the features there. Um, and last, uh, we'll uh, uh, we get to the cloud scale part of the stock. Uh, this is uh, internally uh, we're working on a product called Tiger, uh, coding Tiger, and. Uh, We'll talk about some of the motivations behind it and what we're trying to do. So Kosuke is going to just do a preview of this, of uh, what we're working towards. So for those who attended the keynote, uh, what you got from my intro about Kosuke there was, uh, you know, he's the CTO, programmer extraordinaire. His favorite weapon of choice is an ID. He pulls it out, and uh, he builds uh, code. It's fantastic, great. Uh, but the reality is somewhat different. You know, that was a keynote yeah, version. I have all these two monitors I can show for a project at the time. <laughs> right? But uh, I think this is what he actually sees himself. He's the slide boy for marketing. He spends most of his time building uh, in, in his actual weapon is PowerPoint. He spends most of his time doing uh, slides. Uh, so that's how usually he looks at, uh, I look at him when he's sitting across. So, and here uh, we have the happy team, the VP of product management. And uh, so I usually think of him as this, some kind of master of a Jedi mind trick, so that he somehow makes what he wants to do something that I want to do. <laughs> uh, that's, that's one way to look at it. I, I'll tell you how, how it is real, in reality. Um, so I think of myself as hustler for sales. That's my life. And my actual <laughs> weapon is the clasping hand technique. And Kosuke sees this at least three or four times a week. You know, can I have this feature delivered? And uh, that's how I actually play my Jedi mind trick with him. Uh, jokes apart, uh, we both work for CloudBees, and uh, I think you've heard enough. Uh, you must have heard about us. But very quickly, uh, we are uh, the enterprise Jenkins company, um, and uh, we bring uh, Jenkins operations at scale. Um, that's one of our key uh, value adds on top of Jenkins. And uh, we focus on bringing continuous delivery to organizations. Uh, we do that through multiple ways. So there's a product uh, part of it that you get into. But apart from that, what you see us uh, doing at the bottom, I don't know if it's readable, uh, we do support and support for you know, our plugins and all the open source plugins out there. Uh, there's a professional services uh, aspect for organizations who are bringing uh, the Jenkins platform inside. Uh, and if they need help starting up, we help on that aspect. Uh, we do training. Uh, and if you haven't signed up for newsletters, you should. Uh, that's, that's the place where all the latest and greatest news in open source Jenkins comes out. So we do a, uh, do a number of these things. And, uh, uh, we've been uh, used, uh, as I mentioned earlier today in the keynote, uh, you know, we both set, set the Jenkins Enterprise business up. And as a product manager at CloudBees, I feel very proud to you know, show this slide. It's, it's a veritable who's who uh, in the computing and non-computing industry of who's using uh, our services and uh, our product. Uh, right from people on the cutting edge of technology like Netflix to banks, and I know some of our customers are sitting in here. Uh, there's lately been a great use case published by Orbitz. Uh, you should go and look, look that up on our website. Um, so uh, they've been using us. Getting past the introductions, uh, let's talk about continuous delivery. Uh, so uh, for those, those who have been paying attention to the axiom that software is eating the world, it indeed is. And uh, what I have seen in the last few years, uh, two years especially, is uh, uh, you know CEOs kind of going back to their uh, to people like us on the engineering side and saying like you know my software delivery should be a competitive advantage to me or my competitors, and they go back and ask them uh, how they can sort of do this. 
at, at a quickie level, at a top level, it's, it's all about taking dev to production. It's DevOps. Uh, you've heard of these terms, right? Uh, but when you sort of drill down into it, it's, it's DevOps really stands for more of a cultural thing, right? It's getting this guy, dev, and the ops guy to talk to each other, right? And they're, they're different, as Kosuke was pointing out. It's kind of interesting, at Juice DC, I, I was in a customer meeting and two guys were sitting next to each other and we were talking about DevOps cultural changes and they look at each other, he's like, he's dev, I'm ops, you know, uh, and we talk different. So, so that's the part. And what Kosuke was talking about as, as Jenkins usage has evolved, uh, what, what it has started going towards is it started off with these pockets of automation as you talked about and, and got, you know, the, the pockets of automation have grown. So where these, these two guys actually meet up beyond the group hug stage is where they start talking about automation, right? They start doing this automation, they start uh, delivering things together, and that's where you can, the engineering manager can go back to the CEO and say they can deliver stuff faster. And uh, what sort of ends up, if you get this, is, is a great use case that uh, him and me are very uh, you know, passionate about. This is what people at CloudBees really love and, and do. Is this use case about Tesla. And uh, for those who have heard of Tesla, how many here have? All right, so that's pretty much everyone. Uh, you know, a couple of years back, there was a story that Tesla caught fire. And there was a lot of negative propaganda about it. And what these guys did was they actually analyzed the data that the car sent over the wire to uh, the Tesla uh, factory in, in Fremont, it's quite near to where we live. And they, uh, their analysis was there's a branch hit the undercarriage and pierced the undercarriage and hit the battery, and the battery got ruptured. So if they move the undercarriage, the chassis by one, uh, uh, by, uh, one inch, they could eliminate most of the things, uh, most of these kinds of uh, uh, issues. Now, they did much more than that. They actually bulletproofed it. But if you were a Tesla owner, and you came in uh, in the morning, started your car, unbeknownst to you, last night there was a software update that was sent over the wire. You started your car, and the chassis of the car was raised uh, an inch up. Like, that's phenomenal, right? Think about uh, Ford and BMW trying to do this. It's like millions of dollars in recall. So that's the kind of thing that the CEOs and the companies are seeing and they're trying to figure out how, how do we do that. And where it ties down to what you know, Kosuke was telling was, was you know, what we saw as, uh, as the work towards workflow, is you know, defining your CV as code and heading towards that direction. So let's take the use case of that same engineering manager who, who, whose VP has come down to him and say like, what can I do to deliver software faster? They kind of look at this uh, and they say like, you know, uh, I already am doing CI. It's, it's kind of all, you know, part way there. All I need to do is extend it across. Now that's, that's like one way to do it. And, uh, and when they extend this across, the next stage is really stage and deploy. Again, this is highly sim simplified. This is where things start, you know, crossing organizational boundaries. And this, this is where the dev and the ops team are using different tools. But our hope with workflow was that you're already expressing most of your pipeline with Jenkins. So what you should be thinking about is taking the workflow feature and elevating that as, as, the, as the deployment pipeline across the organization. And Jenkins with, you know, Jenkins with his vast variety of plugins is sort of the orchestrator across these. It already does all of this well. So you can now start orchestrating across the pipeline, across different groups, and this is where your dev and ops team actually start together. So uh, we talked about this last year. We announced this late last year. So just to capture the highlights, what the workflow feature does is defines a DSL to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, express your workflow. And it is programmatic, so you can, have, uh, you can build these real-world complex pipelines by bringing in programmatic idioms like running through loops, doing try catches in case of problems, etc. The other piece that we worked on when we did this was uh, we solved some long-standing issues. So if you're, say, uh, 
a company that whose delivery pipeline spans multiple days, and your slave infrastructure, your master crashes, if you've written this in workflow, you can actually restart your entire flow. Uh, you can restart the flow from you know a, a checkpoint in location. So you're effectively shaving off days worth of you know um, wasted time. And there are a number of other things like uh, one of the uh, features is about uh, uh, about uh, uh, getting human input and approval. And this is where you know if you're pushing things to deployment uh, without human intervention, that freaks managers out. So if you have human intervention, you can sort of get to the continuous delivery stage instead of you know the deployment stage. Uh, and uh, I already talked about you know sort of integrating with uh, with various tool chains around uh, in Jenkins. So the the way I see continuous delivery in the past was uh, I, I see Jenkins as the um, as the bazaar. I grew up in India. Bazaars are very common. The bazaar. There are lots of people in there. Everybody's talking different languages, uh, and there's a currency that's being exchanged between different groups. So the currency from the dev team to the QA team is a war file. From the QA team to uh, pre-production is a war file with a deployment descriptor and, uh, and so on. But there is a huge, huge change coming here. And that change that's coming in has been from Docker. So Docker by itself is quite uh, uh, what it does. Very quick intro into it is it's a container. Uh, it defines your application and the services that these applications require. So your uh, application, your Docker file has your um, WAR file, and it has, say, definition about Tomcat. And coming to think of it, this, this was like an anti-pattern in my Java EE days, where your deployment descriptor was different. But that aside, what this ends up being is a new currency that gets exchanged between different groups. So the dev team can now give a Docker container to the QA team. Does not need a deployment descriptor to describe this environment. The QA team can just bring that up, test their stuff, and then they can pass that to pre-production and production. So that's that's why uh, I think Docker is fairly interesting because it changes the currency that gets exchanged between different groups. But the marketplace, in my opinion, remains the same. So with that, uh, last week we announced in uh, Juice DC uh, a number of plugins to enable uh, Jenkins um, with uh, Docker. And uh, I like Kosuke to sort of get into it and talk to it. Right, so here is where I kind of do the demo. Um, yes, I already talked about you know, many of these plugins at the keynote. The idea is to actually show how this works. So here, I got, I got my instance. Oh. So I got my instance up here, and then let's see, so I'm trying to do this. So the general setup, actually, um, maybe I should go back to the slide just one more time. The general setup is that the uh, you, so you have this the um, the company platform team building a base image. Let's say the Docker image that contains Tomcat but no app. And then you, as an application developer, has another source code repository, build a web app, and then you change things to bake a new image. And then that goes to the runtime environment. So the first piece of this is it starts from this, you know, the base image part. And then, um, so what I'm going to show here is here we have a base image build. So in this case, the base image build is configured as a, just a regular freestyle project. And, um, if I mean, it's big enough, it should switch over to a single, yeah. So, uh, so I have a source code up in the GitHub repository, and this guy contains um, just a base image, aka the Docker file, and then I made some customization to the you know, Tomcat configuration file, so it serves a different uh, the server header. And then um, I check out the source code, and then here I use the, um, the Docker build step. A Docker build and publish plugin so that um, I build the image and then publish the resulting image as the new, you know, new image on this base repository. And then here, uh, because all these plugins, they use the same single credential management scheme, um, I can 
and I just needed to configure this once, and then everywhere else I need to use the uh, access to the Docker registry, I can use the same credential. And that's basically it. Now, the second step of it is going to be owned by different teams. So you know, I didn't specify this as the upstream and downstream relationship, but that is the application build. So what this guy is going to do, this is actually a workflow project. And then so I have a workflow a script that defines that I'm going to show you in a minute. But aside from looking for the source code change in the GitHub, it also is triggered every time the base the Docker images change. So you know, in this workflow, I'm actually going to depend on two, uh, two different kind of images. The one that's used to run the building side, and the other that is just like a you know, base image that we just built in the other project. And then so I, you know, I, I want this build to happen whenever any of these things change. So if the base image change, for example, to you know, incorporate the security fix, then obviously this should be neater. So the beauty of this thing is that the uh, workflow Docker plugin and then this Docker Hub notification plugin kind of talks to each other under, underneath. So I just need to say, look, if any of the different Docker images change, please redo the build. But I don't have to say exactly what images they are. They will just figure out on their own. The actual workflow definition is in the source code, and then that's it. So this um, is the uh, actual workflow definition. The build itself is actually an ordinary Maven build. And then so what I'm going to do is first it gets to, you now this stage tag, it's really just a marker telling Jenkins that, hey, I'm now in the new stage to, to just visualize things a little bit more nicely. And here, so this is the line where it says, well, you know, I got this corporate standard build environment that has all the right you know, build configuration files, compilers, you know, the Maven settings file, what have you. So it's all baked into the nice image. And so I'm going to use that, and then inside that image, I'm going to check out the source code from Git, run the Maven, and then just make sure I save the raw file that's created by it, just so that you know, I, can, I can see it. Um, and then if that is successful, I'm just going to build the container. And then this Docker file contains the instruction to grab the raw file that's built just here. And then you know, as a final step, I'm going to just step forward. So in a workflow, when you so long as you're doing normal things like this, it's kind of fairly straightforward and simple to write, and reasonably readable. So the um, Docker file, just to show you, is also fairly trivial. All it's doing um, is just adding a, you know, basically just copying this file that we just created, right? So it's very obvious stuff. So, um, so what I'm going to do here um, is I'm going to switch it over to the terminal. And then that means I have to bring it over to that side. And um, I just want to make a change to the base image. Um, let's see, so what do I have here? Right, so there's this one file. So this is a, you know, the Tomcat configuration file. And I could, I'm just going to change the, what the server header is going to be for. So um, they use the London whatever. Right, and then, but so let's pretend that this is actually a security vulnerability fix. Right, so I fix critical security vulnerability. I mean, the server had a come on, it had the right conference, right? <laughs> it's totally important. So, and then the, so I'm going to just push this change over to the GitHub. And then, you know, because this Jenkins is configured to monitor the changes in the, uh, in the source tree from the GitHub. It should start picking up building up right away. Um, although this is actually already taking a few long, so I wonder what's going on there. I should have a tunnel. Oh yeah, okay, here it here it came. So I guess it took a little longer than I thought, but alright, so now it's building the base image. And then I I hope that the Wi-Fi has been a little bit spotty here, so I hope it works well, but um, so it's building the image, and now it's sort of like I try to push the new image over. Um, and then so it moves, you know, when this image pushes over, it moves the latest tag. And then the other job that was watching for these changes, they all take note of that, and then they all trigger the new build. So now, the, now we are waiting for the Docker Hub to give us a new talk. So let's see. And then once that, like a push with arrive, once that 
once a script notification has arrived, then you'll start building a new app image. And then we should be able to see that underway. Oh, it did look like the, you know, the port forwarding and so on was working, so I should see it. Now it's time to get rid of the chips here. Why is that? Come on, Docker Hub. You guys got the conference. You should keep the server open, right? Maybe they all left it, right? It did work in the, uh, I guess, hmm, what should I do? I'm tempted to just figure the build manually, to just, to, just to show you the whole demo. All right, so I guess you have to trust my word that this did actually work. Um, it did work beautifully in the, uh, the, the Washington DC, but I don't know what's going on here. So I just manually started it. So now, um, now the build is underway. So you can see it goes through like a three stages. This part of the functionality comes from Cloud Jenkins Enterprise. But now it's building the um, image and then it's creating a new package. Uh, pretty soon it'll be creating a new package. And at the end of it, it will do the deployment. So um, and a new app will start running. So um, the, the other thing is once the, um, the, you know, so in this demo we are doing, we are taking this base image and building an app and then there's all these different versions of the base image flying around. So we want to make sure that the, you know, the new app image we are building here actually contains that security fix. And I can obviously look at that from a test report, but um, another way to do that is if I can go, just go to the, the build history here. And remember the traceability stuff that I talked about. So it leaves this all the fingerprint records as to you know where things were. So and unfortunately, you know, so we need to do a better job in displaying these things. But the idea here is that we got actually three touch three containers. One was the build environment image, which we don't care. The other is the you know the, the space image build. So you know, and then this is the actual image that we built here. So what, from here, what we can tell you is that the, the image of the build actually contains the, the base image that came from this build number. So if you go there and then look at the changes, then you'll see the security fix that we made. So that, in that way, we could verify. And then just to sort of prove the point, I could also run like um, the car command to sort of see, to make sure that it has the right server header. So that's sort of you know, how we can tell that the app is actually running. Um, there's also an interesting extension of the uh, this traceability stuff that allows you to monitor the running containers to see the reports. But um, you know, this is kind of like you know, the idea behind the, uh, the, uh, the traceability things. So, um, so far I talked about you know, people building apps in Docker. So if you're doing like a mobile app, embedded apps and so on, then you know, like a Docker isn't, you might think Docker isn't interesting for you because you know, your eventual app has nothing to do with it. But and there are other parts of the, uh, the Jenkins Docker plugins where you know, it actually helps you even if your end result has nothing to do with it. So you know, here I have this another project. Um, actually, yeah, I'm sorry. So the, the idea here is that you want to use Docker container as kind of isolated, virtualized build slaves that, that can very easily uh, thrown away and then recreated to keep the constant clean state. So um, what I'm trying to show you here is if I just go to the system configuration page, um, if you use the Docker plugins for Jenkins, you can create a new, uh, what we call a new cloud, uh, the sort of elastic cloud build slate that you can list, like, uh, create on demand. So here I have some bit of coordinate to specify where my Docker container is running, but the general idea is that I have this canonical build image, and then I'm tying that to the label called standard. So as so long as the build job now depends on this label, um, then it, it will, Jenkins will create the new build slave from the container and then run the build inside. And then uh, at the end of it, it will throw away the container. So you always you know, are guaranteed to run in a clean environment. So in this project, it's a random you know, node project, but I'm tying the build to happen on the standard node. So um, if I just do the build of this guy, and then we will see what we what we should see is that the build executor, the new executor will appear here, created out of nowhere on the Docker slate, and the build would happen in there, and then 
um, at the end of the day, it will disappear, go, it will go away. So, all right, so here it comes, the new build is going on, and if you're just looking at the inside, right, so in this mode, the people who are putting the workloads doesn't gonna, like, you know, they're not gonna even notice that it's running inside the Docker container. So uh, I think that I, I must have added something. Yeah, so here, I just added a little bit of proof, I guess, to ensure that this build is running inside container, so, you know, you get this, like, a cryptic machine name. But aside from that, like, it's very easy for you to instantly create, like, a maintenance free build state. Now, the slightly different, related but different use case is that, like, okay, you got this, um, you are now the, you know, the Jenkins, um, I guess the people who own the job, and then you have us, you have the, your Jenkins administrator isn't responding fast enough to, you know, your tools requirement and so on. So in those cases, you can use a Docker custom build environment plugin, and then here, instead of you know, configuring this at the system configuration level, uh, you can, inside every build, you could specify um, here in the build environment section, you can specify, by the way, please run my build inside this container. And then, so in that way, you can instantly put yourself into this like a well curated area, and then don't worry too much about what like, the slave that you landed on or what they might have. So, you know, in the that is still somewhat the same. In nights, you know, when you trigger the build, you do run the build, but the end result is that the, um, it will it'll be always running in a specific container. All right? So I think that's what I'm supposed to show here. So back to, back to the presentation. I have to get back to notes here, so I hope we get the problem. Uh, no, that's not a problem. Except, how do we get it to the next one? Except it's a problem. I'm <laughs> 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 sorry. Uh, uh, I have to say, I'm, I'm kind of still okay. All right, struggling with speed. Is that good? No? How about that? Try it, try it. Ah, so it takes our engineer to solve it. Oh, I'm no, no longer an engineer. I give up. That's why I have my class screen hand technique. So uh, we just kept the next three slides just uh, in case you go back to our slide deck to kind of visualize what Kosuke just showed. So the, uh, you know, I thought of this as two meta use cases. The first use case is about uh, connecting, uh, building the CD pipeline with Jenkins. And what you saw Kosuke doing was a, a build that was written in workflow and there's first class support for Docker in workflow now. Uh, you could use a workflow job or a non-workflow job that got triggered by a Docker Hub change and uh, the resultant goal image can now be driven to testing, staging, and production. Right? And uh, Kosuke tied that in the end with, uh, with the Docker traceability feature which sort of points you to what got deployed. So if there is an error in your production environment, you can uh, look at it and map that to your build to see what's happening. Uh, the second set of use cases were just using Docker in the isolated environment. And what Kosuke showed you here was with the, you know, with the Jenkins uh, operation center. I don't know if you were using that. But what you can do is uh, the ops guy can now standardize on build environments for all masters within his organization and then push that to everyone. And the flip, uh, flip side of that use case was uh, this use case, which I think of as uh, the CTO group who is was playing around with new stacks and they want to be on the cutting edge that uh, IT cannot keep up with. Uh, you know, they define their environment and you can use the custom build environment plugin to provide that uh, custom environment as part of your execution. Uh, in terms of what we are thinking of in, uh, as we go ahead from a roadmap, well, we, we just announced this. Uh, what we're planning to do is we'd like to take the same work that we've done in Docker to Kubernetes. I think that's uh, enabling the similar set of use cases with these fleet management tools is one part where Jenkins should be heading. So we are trying to sort of get, uh, get that going. Uh, so if you're interested in joining this effort, I think Kosuke is going to kick this off from the Jenkins dev alias. Uh, from a CloudBeast perspective, uh, what we are looking to do is, is provide an end-to-end -end ops dashboard 
where uh, you can, uh, you know, you can uh, log in and you can start sort of correlating all this data back to your uh, bills and back to your GitHub commits much easier than what Chris UK showed. So with that out of the way, uh, let's get to uh, the, the Cloud Bees section. So I'm going to talk of some bits about the product. And uh, um, so uh, some of, somewhere on our journey about four years back, we started by building a product called Cloud Bees Jenkins Enterprise. And as the use cases got sophisticated, what, what it started doing is, um, yeah, it started having this feature about uh, high availability. So if your master crashes, there's a backup master that can come in and start up. So it's about eliminating downtime. Um, so we've had that going for a while. Um, another use case that was very popular is very popular is if you're bringing this uh, within your organization, you want uh, folders to you know separate your organizations, and then you want to secure those folders with role space access control. So this, this plugin tends to be used quite a bit by our customers. And uh, as, as teams started moving from this you know, small IT department uh, into bigger and bigger teams, <coughs> the use cases got more sophisticated. So there are a number of plugins in our Jenkins Enterprise environment that, that focus on teams <coughs> and uh, somewhat limited organizations. And then people started asking us on how do they manage all the Jenkins master within the organization. And uh, we had a product called uh, we have a product called Cloud Bees Jenkins Operations Center that becomes the single pane of glass across your organization. So you can still get you know the functionalities we are talking about in Jenkins Enterprise, but the Jenkins Operations Center kind of ends up managing this. So you can share resources, you know, uh, cloud resources, uh, share slaves across all these internal masters, provide an internal cloud. You can take the same RBAC that you had and actually push that R back down into individual masters so you have like one single place of configuration. And uh, another feature that uh, we launched fairly recently, uh, maybe it's been less than a year, but uh, uh, what it does is it starts bringing in cluster operations. So if you are an administrator that's trying to push plugin updates to the 10 masters or 15 masters within your organization, you can start uh, you know, pushing those updates through a job configured on the operation center. So as I started the talk, I mentioned that we, you know, there's CD, that's, that's what we do, and then there's Jenkins operations at scale or Jenkins at enterprise scale that we do. So all the operation center features sort of take you there. And uh, there's some additional features in there. So the, the workflow stage view uh, made it in there. The idea, of course, again, just briefly touched upon it, but the idea here was the stages that you define in your workflow show up as columns on the workflow stage view. So you can actually map your entire you know, CD value stream uh, in, in, the, in the workflow, but it kind of gets visualized this way. So there are two use cases that uh, you, you can use this for. So one, as a developer, which you just told me, I no longer am an engineer. But if I was an engineer and I checked in changes, uh, I wanted to see how far into the pipeline did my value stream, uh, how far into the value stream did my commit go. So what you see up on the, the first row is us trying to indicate to you that you're, you, know, you failed at stage three. The other place this tends to get used is uh, from an engineering manager perspective where, the, uh, where what you're looking to do is you're looking across commits that are happening on a pipeline to figure out if something changed. So I can look across uh, the two green rows and try to figure out if a particular row, uh, if a particular stage takes more time than some than in the past. So you can now start honing into issues if there are some things going wrong in your stage deployment. So that's that's what it is showing. The other place that we've spent quite some time was the Jenkins Analytics feature. So we've you know we bundled an Elasticsearch uh, engine in there and we pump out a lot of data. So your build performance data, your queue management data starts getting in there. And there's some custom dashboards that you can use uh, to, to show you uh, what's happening. And, uh, and uh, you can now write your custom sort of dashboards uh, to show you um, above and beyond uh, what we are doing. Um, so that's what we had. Uh, lately, um, uh, lately, what we've done, and we've just announced the CloudBees uh, Jenkins platform today, and uh, some of the things that we've done in this release is, is the um, ability to promote jobs. 
So one of the reference use cases that the operation center with all the masters connected to it enables is uh, is letting you uh, is letting you uh, set up test master environments. People bring in test jobs, they run through those test jobs, they do stuff there, and they promote that onto a production master. So this uh, lets you do that effectively. So within a cluster, you have a test master, you can push the job somewhere else. Um, there's some nifty things in there. You can sort of, you know, we are uh, sort of uh, showing you the path to the, uh, to the end uh, uh, master. And you can find your jobs in a folder on a different master. And it integrates with the role space access control plugin. So if you're trying to push a job into a master that you don't have permission to, you know, you can't push jobs there, and so on. The, uh, the other feature that we've, we've done is this cross-master job trigger. So the use case here is when you start scaling uh, Jenkins and you start scaling it horizontally uh, with Jenkins Operations Center, uh, what you want to do is your production CD pipelines actually now span multiple masters. And so what you want is a capability of triggering a job from one master, say a dev master, onto a QA master. And this feature lets you sort of trigger that and uh, have cross master uh, trigger. So that's that's what we we launched recently. Uh, but the main thing that we we are actually announcing today is uh, the notion of uh, Cloud Beast Jenkins platform. And uh, this actually came in from uh, our customers. So what we started finding with our customers is, um, you know, they start they usually start small and they bring in Jenkins Enterprise. And as more and more teams come in, they start loading the Jenkins instance, and they scale that vertically. And uh, when they get to a point where they are, you know, a point of a lot of pain, and they want to re-architect this thing, they come to us and they want an operation center. And that operation center, you know, the first task is they need to now break their jobs in uh, into different masters and connect that to the operation center. And typically, that's that's you know some involved work. So we wanted to take that away from people that you know they they should just architect right. Uh, we've talked about this in the past. We see the future of uh, Jenkins scalability as scaling horizontally. So what the Cloud Bees Jenkins platform does is bundles the operation center and the enterprise product together, so people can start off right. And uh, uh, we're starting off with a, a team edition, which is focused on smaller teams, you know, smaller teams and small organizations. And there's some team addition features in there. And uh, on the enterprise side of things, you, you have the whole enchilada. And you have the team addition features and the enterprise addition features. And some of those features I've already talked about on the, on the team side. Uh, uh, what I haven't talked about is the ability to use you know, the couple of plugins to help you do Git uh, and GitHub, work with Git and GitHub. And, uh, We've also bundled some of the Docker stuff that we've done here. It's all in open source, but we've bundled it here so people can start off uh, easier. Uh, on the enterprise side, the high availability that I touched upon, that's available <coughs> here. And there are a number of other plugins, like Fast Archiver. And given in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip over. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in addition, what our customers asked for and our partners asked for was you know, the availability of Jenkins platform on these environments. So uh, we've, uh, uh, we already had a partnership with Pivotal Cloud Foundry. What we're doing is launching the Jenkins platform there. It, ha it integrates with Cloud Foundry. Uh, how many here actually use Cloud Foundry? None, all right, so I'll just keep over with <laughs> How many here use Amazon Web Services? All right, so that's great. So there is a, 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 a plugin, there are a couple of plugins that let you share these cloud slaves on operation center and push them down to all masters. So you have just one place to configure this. If you're building pipelines, uh, what you can do is you can use the, uh, there's a web services CLI. So you can use that within your Jenkins job. Azure, one. So yes, there is a Jenkins platform on Azure. Do you use it? No, no, two. Yeah, I'm not yeah, yeah. Two, all right. <laughs> um, all right, uh, so with that out of the way, uh, so just to sum up, you know, the way we see uh, the platform moving ahead is there's some team addition features that are on small teams, and then enterprise addition that's about enterprise scale uh, features. And what we've been internally working on is uh, something I call Tiger, uh, which is Jenkins as a service. So this is a preview. This is not a product today. 
But the problem that we're trying to solve is uh, we are getting beyond the point where it's, it's small organizational units deploying Jenkins. As everybody gets the advantage of CD at scale, uh, you know, organizations are looking to roll out Jenkins at scale to thousands of developers. They want a clear-cut demarcation between the admins who are man uh, managing Jenkins versus the end users who are using it. They want to have like central autonomy versus uh, versus uh, central control versus autonomy. So this has been coming to us as a requirement for a while, and uh, you know I've asked Kosuke in the last six months. That's what he's been busy uh, with. Uh, so I'll let him talk to it. Right. Okay. Yeah. So this is the, uh, one of the projects that I'm really excited about. You know. So at some point, kind of gets tedious to like deploy instance, deploy new Jenkins over and over again. So more and more companies are interested in operating this at a large scale, like almost like a Jenkins of a service. Right? You know, so you're a big company, you have a lot of product team coming up you know, every so often. You want to give them each a new Jenkins instance, and then you know, when the project is over, you want to show it. So you want to like, operate things like that. And in this kind of environment, you want you know, self-provisioning experience for developers so that they can press a button you get the whole new master instance. Um, you want to customize the out-of-the-box experience uh, when the new master starts up, it's already integrated with your corporate you know, active directory or something. Um, but as an operator of this entire environment, you want to retain some kind of central management mechanism so that, let's say, if you want to install a new version of Git plugin across the board, you don't want to do it like a 28 different times. So you know, when we hear about use cases like this, like you know, what we think is, oh, like we actually already have that technology. That's called DevOps Cloud, which is what we run on the public internet. You know, we run more than a thousand masters on EC2 at any given time. Then they all come with the like, elastic build slate. So we have like a big pool of boxes that's you know, giving out to your tenants at any given time to run the builds. And it has obviously modified out of the box experience. So what we've been trying to do is basically take the same idea, but provide that as a packaging software that is something you can install on your data center, which could be like in a VPC on AWS, so you might be still running it in the cloud, but the point is that we give it to you so that you can operate that for your organizations. And because they keep, keep on changing names at the last minute, this time we said, screw it, we're not going to even try to name it that front, so that's why we've been calling it Tiger. At least uh, hopefully no one would sue us for the trademark name. Um, but so again, the point is, yes, the, uh, it's a package software, you can install it, and then you in turn turn around and for the rest of the company, you operate this like a service, and it comes with a multi-tenanted master and slave, so you, know, you can create the masters and slaves very, very easily. And uh, it that brings in all the goodies of the cloud with Jenkins platform, so the stuff we saw, the analytics, the bulk, bulk operations, cross-master triggers, all that stuff that you know, is useful is readily available in this environment. And initially, we are targeting the two platforms, the Amazon Web Services and the OpenStack for people you know, really want their, like, to run this on their own hardware that's wrapped up in their data center. And the idea is that the rest of the platforms should follow relatively quickly once we know, you know how to do more than one at the same time. So from the IT's point of view, this actually looks like a single big, like a relatively static environment. So you know, in the middle tier, you have a lot of, lot of big honking boxes and these are gets like carved up into small chunks. Like, and each, inside each Docker container, we run like a master, so build slaves. And that needs to be sandwiched between the front end reverse proxy so that you know, the user's traffic could get routed to the right places. And then we need the storage to basically store all the Jenkins homes because they need to be persistent. So, you know, if we, so then this is what you need to get from your IP, you have to be still accept on the scenes. But um, once you get this going, um, let's see, do I have time to do demo? Maybe I don't. Um, so perhaps I should just show, well, all right, I'll just do one. If, if you can't go over uh, time in Jenkins conference, I don't know which conference can you go over time. Please, I would, how many would like to see the demo even if it goes five minutes and both? Um, okay, okay, all right. <laughs> all right, thank you, thank you. So I'll go right past the 45 so minutes. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so this is the, uh, the CJLC, the Jenkins Operations Center Control. Um, and this is uh, the administrator of the cluster, you will see this environment. So it, now, now you can now create a new, new Jenkins master by coming over 
here in the new item, and, and I really hope that you'll get to improve some of the UI down the road. But um, so let's see, I did the pop stroke goal, so I guess next is hotel. Um, <coughs> and then I do the uh, manage, there you go, the manage client class, uh, manage client class, uh, client master. And then that's it. Um, so what's going on behind the scene? Uh, what's going on behind the scene here? Is that is that the so the, you know, we are looking so we have all these big honking boxes under our control, right? In this demo instance, I I got this running on AWS and I got three boxes. So I'm looking for like the, the system will automatically start looking for available box um, that has like a list loaded. And then oops, and then start the new master. So it looks like a slide order would be seen in program, but you know, it added a new master. And then it'll start you know, the updating the front end web here to proxy the load down to, to this guy. And then this guy will also connect back to the Gravity Jenkins Operation Center to basically take the commands from that guy. And basically it's you know, ready to do the action. So, um, so all the authentication, et cetera, is pre set up and it's piggybacking on what I talked about in the Operation Center. Okay. This is not good. Back to the first page. I had this problem before. But, oh, sorry. I to get to the right one. Yeah, so that's, that's what happens. Um, and then um, I'll go ahead and talk about this slide as well, which is so once this master gets going, you know, they're also already pre configured to get the build stage from the big honking boxes as well. So whenever this Jenkins master wants to do a build, it asks this uh, tiger, hey, I need to get the new build stage, please. And then uh, the guy would produce a new container, so it, the build is still isolated inside, you know, individual node, and then it gets handed over, attached to the master, so it can do the build. So is that um, should be able to show this? Yeah. So now it's while well, while I was busy talking, it got all oh, the master connected and provisioned. So if I click this link, then you get to the brand new Jenkins master. And then here, just to show that I can do the build, I'm going to create an new style project. Um, and then, so the first time around, it has to load and compile and load the JD templates. So it takes a little bit more time. But, um, so I can, let's see, I can do, um, I can do the D, maybe, my canonical example would not be like just three for 10 seconds. And I, let's make sure that I'm running, not running on the master. And so if I do the build now, it will start talking to this underlying, you know, cluster-like environment, start, start launching up a new build server, I mean the new build slaves, and pretty quickly it should start, it should get the new machine to do the build. All right, so now it goes. So here it goes, it's been doing the build. And then after, um, yeah, so this is, yeah, you get um, yeah, you get some you know random non descript machine name to just to prove that it's running on a container, and then that's it. So, um, and then the good thing about it, so in this kind of scheme, like you don't really have to worry about where your master or your build stream is running, right? It's somewhere in that like a cluster of big honking boxes, but you don't really care where they are. Right? That's not that's not what you want to think about, um, but. It's, it's, it's also, the underlying cluster is made in such a way that, that if you lose the node, um, it will automatically you know, be move the master around to new places. So what I'm going to do is to kind of like, a, you know, I need to simulate the failure in Jenkins to trigger this fade over activity. But all Jenkins is also stable, so I can never kill it. So I'm going to, I'm going to like a basically go behind the scene and then kill the process. That statement just killed our support business. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's actually horrible. No. <laughs> uh, so what I'm going to do is just go log into these in each of the boxes. I need to find the right machine. So if I'm lucky, this happens very quickly. But otherwise, I, I might have to uh, look at up to three guys. So I'm looking for a master that started very quickly. I think that guy that got four minutes, so this must be it. So this is my lucky day. So I'm just going to take this container and then kill it. So um, 
So this is like a simulating the hard loss of a, a single master. So if I go back to the browser quickly enough, then this page should stop loading um, because the backend service is lost. So, but you know, the tiger also noticed that, oh, this master that's supposed to be running is no longer available. And then so now it starts finding another place to be able to launch this server. It makes sure that the storage, you know, we also need to move the storage over, right? The Jenkins hall needs to be persisted. So we'll make sure that the storage is made available in the other big hunting boxes, and then it will launch the new Jenkins master. So the net result is, you know, from time to time, for various reasons, we might lose individual masters. Okay, or you might even lose the entire Jenkins box. I mean, the entire big honking box. And then lots of master might need to be moved away. So some individual master might experience some downtime from you know, here to there, but hopefully they are each small so they come back fast enough. And then more importantly, the cluster of the whole, they keep up and running. So you won't have to you know, be, you know, spend time trying to make sure that the individual master is up and running or monitor those. You can take care of them in a much more easy way. So hopefully, well, um, this will be back quick enough, and then I can show you that it has persisted to stay, and then that would be the conclusion of the demo. Uh, so what happens if a, a big yeah, honking yeah. box crashes? Yeah, so the, if, if I kill the entire big honking box, the reason I don't do it is because you know, it, it doesn't, like, it, it tries to be a little bit more conservative in failing over, because you can, for, you can have a temporary network loss. And you don't want that to immediately result in like all the master giving you the run. So it goes, it spends like a, I think up to like a minute or two or something like that before it declares the node as false. So it's not quite like a good for demo, but I can totally do it. But, um, so anyway, so that's, you know, now it's back with all the glory, with all the build record intact. So you see that it, you know, it has successfully. Um, has if you had a workflow checkpointed uh, job, you could have just picked up from the uh, nice try, but we haven't tested that. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but that's the idea, yeah. Um, so, you know, that's the, I think that was basically the quick demo. Uh, right, so you was doing the fade over. So this was a fade over scenario, like, you know, lost of a master, moved it over to another place. So I think that's the, basically it, and um, just to bring the point home. Uh, yeah, so we are looking for a small number of our, you know, people, users who are interested in seriously trying out and then help us bring this to the, the GA product. So if you're interested in it, drop by at the booth. Um, I already mentioned that we are hiring the evangelist, but we're also looking for uh, lots of other roles, you know, the product manager to work with outreach, engineers, sales, whatever. So if you're interested in working with us, then please drop us a note as well. Um, so in the end, so to just wrap it up, so you can, you know, we see things like Voxel and Docker, you can build a lot of competing modern CD pipeline relatively easily. And uh, with this, we are also launching the Cloud is Jenkins platform that comes with the team edition and enterprise edition to bring CD to the different audience. And then uh, in the looking forward, we got, we got some exciting projects going on with Tiger that we hope to be able to use it. Okay, so thank you very much for letting us run over time. I really appreciate it.